right, everybody, welcome. Sunday, Monday, wherever you are in the world, it can be different times, but the market, of course, is open in the futures and the Asian session is open. How's everyone doing for Monday or Sunday? You guys doing well? I'm feeling pretty damn good. I'll just quickly uh, link this into the rooms again, just to remind everybody that we are live. One second. Let me do that right now, guys. Remember, get your questions ready today as well. If you have any particular questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. And I'll just quickly set up here as well. Actually, I don't know if this is... Uh, I think I, I think I've done it correctly. Anyway, let me just quickly finish off this last bit here. Make sure I'm in streamer mode so no one can hear all that other stuff. All right. Streamer mode. There we go. Perfect. All right, guys, what do we have here on the market? My goodness. Now, nasty futures, obviously telling us a little bit of weakness here on Monday, but will we really have the weakness? That is the question. We've got to put in our minds two things. One, we're still technically in an uptrend, okay? So overall, the trend is still up at this stage. Now, why is that? Because when we go over to the SPX, where are we? We're exactly in this location. We're basically on the 50 exponential moving average. We know this is the key zone. Remember, do your analysis whenever possible on the real market. You can trade the futures, that's fine, but the real market is key. So if you've been short, I think it wasn't, I think it was pretty fair for you to potentially take profit on our uh, short positions through that Friday session. Congratulations if you traded the channel well. Did anyone trade the channel pretty well last week? I think you guys had some big brains. You probably did pretty well getting it off this zone. There was three opportunities. Obviously, there was a little bit of buying opportunities on the smaller time frames, and then the sell-off into the quadruple witching event forced it straight back into this low. But we still maintain really a bit of a neutralized market condition, and I think that's something that's important. Let's just quickly give a shout-out to a few people here. We've got Jasser, we've got Neil, we've got Stacy, DJ AJ, Winter Mute, Philip. And of course, Christopher Collins says, greetings, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, Wintermute says, Tom, what is your personal opinion on altcoins? Doing well here. How are you? Uh, I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing all right. Be bet I'm doing pretty good because of the market, but I will say, give us some uh, freedoms over here. That'd be cool. <laughs> Hopefully we get out very, very soon. I'll tell you what, damn. Some, some parts of Australia, they really are having a, my sister's in a freedom state and it's uh, pretty good for her, but not so great for us. Anyway, you guys don't care about that. What are my opinions on altcoins? I love altcoins, but I only love altcoins that are networks. So I guess <clears throat> for me, I think we're in a transitional part of crypto. I'll explain this first, then we'll get back into the stock market. It's a really important factor when you're entering different markets. So we've got to think about the different bull cycles of crypto. So we've had like a first bull cycle, which was just the initial one. Then we had, of course, the more famous one, which was what, 2012, 13, something like that, if I remember rightly. Then we had that 2017 bull cycle. And then, of course, we've had this bull cycle, 2000 and let's call it 20 to 21. So um, what you really want to think about with crypto is that it's maturing. So what that means is it's kind of like the beginning of the internet. You had like the internet boom when Apple came out and people loved Apple. Then that died off. Then you had the dot com. Then you had the internet boom of the 90s, early 90s. Everything became crazy. Then you had your dot com <clears throat> or whatever you want to call it. Then you had your uh, 2000, let's call it 2020, 2021 might be like the GFC into the recovery there. And I think we're starting to mature this market. So what that then therefore means is it's not going to be the next time, you know, let's say crypto goes crazy. I don't believe it's going to be just every coin is fantastic. I think people are going to start to select their HODL coins over a longer scale. Remember, ideally, the next big run, whenever that does occur, or even the run that's happening right now, you're getting bigger institutions coming in. They will pick projects that have some basis. My favorite thing about crypto is always going to be if you have a coin and that coin is, oh, sorry, a network, and that network is creating new ICOs, et cetera, on it, and it has a community of coders 
remember coders are key. It all starts with the coders. We like these guys. If you have these guys on your network coin, then I think that's much more of a tick. If you're talking about, oh, this coin solves transactions, meh, I don't really like that. Now, that's my opinion. It may not be your opinion, but I'm not, I don't care about transactions. There's plenty. Remember, it's all about transactions can always be improved and improved and improved and improved. It's like, is Bitcoin good for transactions? No, it's horrible. Is Litecoin slightly better, but it's still horrible. It's going to constantly be improved throughout the time. So what you're really looking for is you need news to constantly come out. How does news come out? ICOs or some kind of like network creation on them. Then you've also got to have obviously coders. We love coders. It's kind of just as general principles. So in terms of alts, be, be careful what you pick. Don't just pick anything. If you know that it's a bit of a crap coin, trade it, but don't necessarily hodl it. Get what I mean? Trade it. Look through the rubbish. Look through the news. Is it really got staying power? That's a question you've always got to ask yourself. Okay, back over to the stock market. Let's go back to that daily. So here's some questions coming in here. Uh, DJ AJ says, I feel like the recovery after the crash from uh, China ban allowed people to be more confident in crypto. Uh, potentially, that's true. And then Philip Leng, uh, Leng Langdon, I think it is. Hi, Tom. I was following you previously, got busy and lost track, but catching up. I've noticed you've started using a couple more indicators, Bollinger Bands and Volume Pro. Just curious, why have these been added? Uh, Bollinger Bands, no particular reason. I just felt like adding them so it looks cool. Uh, you don't need them. But for other people, it can be a visualization thing. I don't need Bollingers. I don't actually need any of these things. Um, like, say, Volume Profiles, they make zero difference to me. Uh, however, I understand how they can be helpful to other people. So if you have like a volume profile, remember really what it's doing is it's just showing you the most touched zones. So if you know how to draw proper support resistance, why the hell do you even need this? You don't really. A lot of people think it looks cool and they think it's super awesome and they're fancy with it. Uh, I don't really tend to, to care that much about it. But it is still a cool tool to bring and bring together with your technical analysis. So it's kind of like, you know, Bollinger Bands, are they a good indicator? Yeah, they can be, but it's like RSI. You'll know when things are overbought or oversold based on price once you've done thousands of hours like I have into the charts. You just always will know. So US 500 is on its 50 exponential moving average. If we then go to the SPX and we think about the weekly 20, which is probably our eventual aim here, if we are going to pull back, what we want to do is we want to take the distance from the top down to this level and we want to think about how big is that pullback. So it's actually quite measly. It's only about 4.43% down to this level. Now, traditionally in proper pullbacks, if we go back over to past kind of pullbacks, let's say this one over here. How big is this one? Let's take the distance here. Top to bottom, about 11. So about 8 to 10% is pretty common. This one obviously much deeper. Uh, then we go back to other standard pullbacks over time. And you want to measure them up to get a bit of an idea of how deep they usually are. See this one here, about 9%. That one will be about 8%. It's incredibly common for pullbacks to be around that range in a proper correction. So I think you've got to define what are you trying to achieve in this market? Are you wanting just to trade? I say two things, nimble and fast. <laughs> if you want to trade right now, be nimble and fast. In any kind of fearful market, Shorts will not necessarily last as long as you think, and they'll be rejected by huge buy the dip style situations. We've seen that happen, and I know a few people in the chat right now will absolutely, absolutely be realizing that. They're going to realize how many people were nimble and fast last week and did success versus the people that were in. Oh, I think it's going to go lower. Oh, I think it's going to go lower. You can't predict it right now we don't know exactly how strong the buy the dip is from retail slash whether wall street actually want to crash this it's ultimately in their hands do they want to set the market back into a correction or do they just want to get go with the flow get a bit of a pullback and then gear for the rest of the year i don't know if i knew i'd be a bazillion billionaire because i would take a monstrously leveraged contracts all we could do is we can find the statistics that lead to the best outcome. The best outcome, I think, is being nimble and be fast. Jasser says pullback will happen in staircase fashion over the next four to eight weeks. It makes sense for October to potentially be the zone. 
Um, and that that is a that is a valid valid kind of position. So this is obviously taken from our private community. You guys can see here where the calls are. They're sitting at 450 in October. This kind of makes me think that there's still a topping range in the market. Now, as long as this stays high, and you can check this on Yahoo Options or, of course, in the community, just load up uh, tr dash oi dash <coughs> or space spy, and then you'll look at it. As long as there's so many strikes here, it's not going to be in their best interest to let it through. So let's actually load together now. Let's just do this. I'm going to do it right now. What's the November expiration date? Uh, let me just give this spy. Um, so we got 11. And what's the main strike? I forgot the date. One second, guys. Just get this. This is the Yahoo option strike. So you can actually go and check. Because remember, it's not necessary. It's just showing you the key strike zones. It's like a, a quick check. So it's November 19th. There we go. So I'm going to type this in. I grab the, the data from the robots. Okay. Here we go. And I think it shows us a very interesting story here. So let's bring this up. Now, we'll want to check this once every couple of days. But what you'll notice is that the spread is much more towards the puts. Does everyone see that? See how there's lots of puts? Now, they are low. The puts are low here. But these are what I would call put walls. So basically, we have a 400 spy put wall coming into November. Somewhere around there, we've got a put wall. Then we've got mega put walls coming underneath that. So what this, I think, believe, I believe this means is that the market is incredibly unlikely to correct underneath those levels. Let's go back to the SPY. Let's actually go over here. We'll change this to the SPY for a second. This is just the way I think about things. And um, yeah, I, I like to think about markets this way. Uh, basically, if we get down to 400, which is a huge pullback here, see how the 400 is around 11.5%. Actually, fairly standard, not something to be scared of. And somewhere around this zone would be where we expect the deepest kind of pullback to occur. Now, if it was to go underneath those levels, we would continuously watch these puts and see where all these strikes are coming through for these different dates. And we would make sure, this is this is QQQ, but we would make sure that we are very well aware where these huge amounts of puts are because the market will not go underneath these puts for long. And if it does, it'll just be stop hunts and then it will try to get above them for expiration. So <clears throat> this is how I look at the market. I always do my quick analysis here. If you see a red, just red everywhere and the market's going up and there's red puts everywhere like there was last year, do you think the market will crash into that? Unlikely. It's kind of like Tesla. When Tesla had huge amounts of puts on it all those years ago, the market just continuously ramped up Yet there was Michael Burry and every other person trying to short Tesla with huge amounts of bought puts. They had bought puts everywhere. And the market was like, no, <laughs> come on now. We're not paying those out. There might have been valid reasons, but they were not trying to pay them out. It's a little bit contrarian. It's a little bit different way of looking at it. And you're only going to use this information for one thing, and that is to find your key technical analysis levels should it actually correct into these zones and then you're always optimistic about the market. You have to remain optimistic. So you're using these levels just to get a bit of a gauge of what's going on, but don't let it cloud your technical analysis. TA is first, okay? Obviously, what's really first in the, the investor's mind is going to be government and Fed and the company's fundamentals. But TA is first for the nimble, quick person looking for the pickups, looking for the change rounds, looking for the investment zones, those type of things. You can use this quite effectively. Don't let this cloud your judgment. It might show us that we believe that based on this chart right now, that actually October could be weak as well. But we need to continuously see a huge line of calls sitting on this point. Uh, yes, we certainly can look at Moderna. No problems. Uh, Jasser says, <laughs> January, Tom, is where I see big money putting their puts. Yeah, I mean, there, there could be also some huge money there. I mean, tax will also be a question. What we, again, if there's lots of puts there, I don't tend to find the market drops into huge amounts of puts. It tends to actually hold above those zones. We call them put walls. So if we look at the SPX, we've got some targets here that could occur. If we get past this daily 50, what is the next logical conclusion for us to go down to? We'll use the SPY again. And if we're basing it on this week, <clears throat> I think 430 was the next level. So around this 430 zone was the next level. Let's go back over to the weekly here. And what you'll notice is see how 430 is around the weekly 20. 
So this zone, if we get underneath here, you could nimbly short it into the 430. Would I short past the 430? No, I wouldn't. If you if you scaled out and left a portion on, you could. But let's just say it gets underneath the 50 today, pulls back to the 50. So we see something like this. So we basically get underneath, we close underneath. Then the next session we ramp and we find a sell here on the smaller time frame. There would be a case scenario to try to go to the 430. If you look at the options, puts and everything, there's a lot sitting this week around this zone. Okay. So because there's some sitting around this week for expiration around this zone, that would be a scenario. If we're looking for buys and we're looking at how do we get into better positions this week in the market. And remember, whatever's happening on the SPY or the NASDAQ, you can go your favorite stock and it will be doing a very similar thing, especially the big ones, because this is made up of the big ones. Then we're looking for a closure of back above this zone, probably a 444 on the SPY. Then we're going pull back, lightning bolt, take along into the 449, 448 area, which we know is 4490. And then if we get past 4490, well, we've got to go long, don't we? I mean, you'd be hard pressed to believe that we could crack this level and for it to not mean something now. That 4490 on the S&P, I would have that line all day long on my charts this week. Does that make sense, guys? We don't. We have to be neutral. We don't know exactly what's going to happen because otherwise we'd be soothsayers. We're going to trade both sides and we're going to do it because we're not too concerned necessarily. If it comes back, we've got a plan. And if it goes up, we've got a plan. Nimble, quick indices is probably the easiest trade, actually. Indices has been the easiest trade for the last couple of weeks. you notice I've pulled off a lot of stocks. And why have I pulled off stocks? Except for I've been long on AMC and Tesla, randomly. It's because they look crap. <laughs> um, a lot of stocks. The uranium stock was, was, was a great find three or four weeks ago. That was fantastic. But most of these positions, you know, you look at these stocks and you think, well, I mean, Square's looking a little bit better, but is it fantastic? I mean, it's an okay level. It's closed above. I can see why people are buying it. You look at Apple, it looks disgustingly short. You know, you could think about that 141. You can see it's underneath the wicks. This doesn't bode that greatly for us. We go and look at Amazon. I've liked this chart a lot more, but that was pretty much a standout. Google just looks horrible. I mean, look at this close. You got a peak, you got a trough, you got a lower peak, and you've just got a lower trough. I mean, this Google... It, it looks really nasty. Would I short it? I mean, it is a short, but it is just so hard to short, guys. It is easier to long. I mean, it takes... Shorting indices is one thing, but shorting individual stocks, I mean, does that look short to you guys? What do you think in the chat? <clears throat> and we will we'll look at Moderna and we will look at a few other people. Blue Maserati says, Tom, at this hour, Sunday night, love it. Yeah, we will try to do these times. I'm aware I've been doing a little bit of switch into the US just so I know that uh, you guys can do it. I think around our 10 or 11 a.m. is best, but this gets lunchtime in Australia so people can maybe watch it. Uh, Lieutenant Dan says, some of those levels are huge levels lower. I agree. I agree. And then Kim Lim says, hey, Tom, have a look at December SPY heat map. 24 million of premium in December. Uh, which which way, Kim? I can't. I won't look at it just yet, but... Oh, did you request it <clears throat> in the room? Let's have a look. It's good to bring this stuff together. Can you guys see how it's good to have? It's like confirmation bias <laughs> towards your TA, but ultimately don't let it cloud your judgment of the TA. Don't let you cloud your judgment. DJ AJ says, looks like a short, but I hate shorting good companies. Absolutely, DJ AJ. I think you've come up with a great concept there. If you don't have success in shorts, just buy. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you're buying every single zone. You buy very particular areas that you find either are recoveries, either have you know, some great principles of, um, you know, maybe turnaround, like lightning bolt turnarounds, recovery turnarounds. You just use your technicals and use the buy zone. Shorting good companies is tough. That's fine, but it is tough. Uh, the 440 strike, <clears throat> a lot of puts, Kim, or what is it? Oh, okay, I'm loading it up. Let's have a look here. 440 puts, yeah, I see it. <clears throat> I would hope the market is not actually lower than this. 
Remember, these will be manipulated quite a lot. So the ones that are out here, that's why we have to check it all the time. Just because we've got negative puts coming through across the board all the way over here, I still think that even with this amount of puts that are going on here, they could be closed early. So we could see them kind of like wiped off the, the chart very, very easily. So yes, they're there. We, we recognize that, but we don't. We can't really trade too much off that. We can't really trade this too much off that. But you're starting to see the, the point here. We've got like Microsoft. I mean, they did a buyback. This thing was doomed. If there was no Microsoft buyback, the, the market would have sold off earlier. This was crap. I mean, this is just another case of why shorting can be difficult. It's good to make money in both ways, but why I say short the indices more than I say short a stock is because of this reason. Now, if you short unhealthy, hideous stocks that are just hideous and they're not great companies, all power to you. That's great. However, when you start shorting a quality company like Microsoft, this is a go signal. There is no doubt that is a go signal. You sell right there and you say you put your stop above here and you're not taken out just yet. But geez, oh geez, you would be scared. <laughs> um, and, and you'd probably be looking at maybe even exiting the position here. And this is what happens. They add a buyback. So we get a nice share buyback and it goes up and you think, oh, fuck. <laughs> What's going on here? I've gotten absolutely screwed by the short when it's been easier just for me to long you know, certain zones. So just remember, yes, Microsoft would have already been collapsing, I feel like, if they hadn't announced this. And I maybe, maybe it's like an orchestrated plan. You never know. All right, we've got Moderna here. So M-R-N-A, let's have a look at Moderna. Moderna bounced off the good support area. So you remember, resistance becomes support. That's a nice movement back up here for Moderna. I, I Look, again, I would ignore this for long-term holds myself because of market capitalization being so high. It's worth $173 billion. I understand the story. I understand the shots every year and this and that and everything else. But I also can never, ever, ever unsee this chart, okay? And when I see a chart that goes like this, I always know that at some point in the future, I'm going to get a cheaper price. Pretty much almost every company I can think of ramps and then it has these monster declines. It misses one earnings and you lose 30% on the stock. So I think it's a good trade stock at the moment. Um, that's the way I look at it. If you, this rejection is good. Let's go down to the four-hour chart so we can get a bit of an understanding of the price. So you can see here, resistance, support, great pickups both ways. If you limited either of these prices, I think that's valid. Uh, where you get really excited is a 441 plus closure on a significant time frame. So when I see these wicks not closing above, then I go to the two hour, not closing above, perfect. I could use a two hour, one hour, perfect. I could even use a one hour. So this is where you'd scale. So let's say you had some in here. Congrats, that's not bad. Then you get above 441, you could scale in again with the idea of taking at least a 460 off. It'd be a double bottom inside of trend at that point. Healthcare can do whatever it feels like as well, even in a down market. And then we we keep we keep basically looking for um, buy potential. So basically, we would take a little entrance here. We'd wait for maybe the daily to close then, and then we'd maybe scale a little further portion in as we let the confirmation come through on the different timeframes. And that allows us to scale into the position. And we might be taking a position because we're feeling a bit of FOMO on the hour because it's closed above. But remember, the hour can fully reverse. So what we're doing is we're adding to the position as we see the timeframes, as we see that confirmation bias come through where the market's like, no, 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 I really want to be up here. All you nasty bears aren't going to stop us now. If you're wondering about a good short, I think actually closing under 415 would be a fantastic short right now if that happened for Moderna as well. Um, it is a pretty highly priced stock. So when it falls, it could fall quite aggressively. And you're looking back somewhere around this zone. Put the line chart on, slam a point straight around there. And you've got a key level. Great, great chart to look at this week. Absolutely. Uh, Wintermute says, what about the cancer study? Uh, again, it's by the look. What do we know? Actually, Wintermute. You answer this question. What do we know about healthcare that's unanimous with all healthcare companies across the world? Mm -hmm. By the way, yes, we can look at silver. Don't worry, Lieutenant Dan. We will look at silver. Phil C says, Microsoft doing people dirty. And then we've got AMD here from Kunal. Absolutely. Uh, what are the largest AI ETFs? I don't know. I guess Tesla would. I mean, not Tesla. I guess ARK would have one. Um. 
Yeah. Jassa says NASDAQ just tanked. Yep. I saw. Well, down 0.11%. Calm, calm down, Jasper. <laughs> 0.11%. Actually, the S&P, the Dow actually is the one that tanked, down 0.45% just then. Uh, Ray Lim says, Tom, I had started, uh, I had shorted Apple at 155, tried to scale out at 145 on Friday. Do you expect Apple to move to 142? At current price, you would think it does move down to that 142. We talked about this last week, Ray, and I think you've done well scaling out of it. Um, short, you got to be nimble and quick. Remember, I don't care whether this one goes down like a 10-foot barge pole and just goes all the way down. This is a life skill. Being a nasty bear looking for the salmon is not easy, guys. You've got to be short. You've got to be sharp. You've got to be quick. And if you're da- if you're using options, don't buy a straight put. You will get absolutely stuffed. You have to use a spread. Spread, 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 spread. Christopher Collins says you're not shorting the company. You're shorting the chart. That is correct, Christopher. However, we have also a big companies have the ability to do buybacks. So the better the balance sheet, the better the buyback potential if bad things are happening to them in comparison to a really crappy, shoddy company. Remember, a really shoddy company with bad books cannot generally do that type of thing. What will they instead do? Capital raise. And if you get a capital raise, boom, goes the stock. I probably just blew someone's ear off and it goes right back down. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Blue Maserati and Wintermute have got it right. Buy the rumor, sell the news. You are correct. The the chance that market basically packs in somewhere around like, you know, let's call it, if I could put an arbitrary number on it, which I make up right now, it packs in a certain level of optimism into every, every bit of news, whether that be an announcement within a range, whether that be anything. That's why people can't understand, oh, they've, they've got record profit, yet the stock's going down. I would hope by now our community has big brains enough to actually look at the left-hand side and if the stock's gone like that into the announcement and then they've hit a record profit and it's above all expectations and it's gone down, why? Because it's a buy the rumor, sell the fact event. And in healthcare, you've got to be really careful. You've got to scale a little bit, especially if you can't wear the long-term ramifications of them not missing the study or even if the study's good. Remember, a missed healthcare study can slam you 30% in a day. It can easily hit you 30% in a day. <clears throat> well done, Jasser. Very good. I don't blame you for shorting the NASDAQ at all. If you look at it, there's the level. There's probably where you started shorting. I don't blame you at all. On the futures market here, look, this is the box we drew last week. We've got the box, the same levels. And you can see here the little shooting star pin bar rejection. And we're getting you're getting rewarded handsomely for that right now. And you might have you know, some some ideas about where this can go. I mean, obviously, this is one level. This 15, whatever it is, 268 kind of zone that's just randomly there. Who knows why? And then the next level is probably a 15.2. You know where the levels are. So congrats. I mean, there's not nothing wrong with that. FDA rules all? Yes. <laughs> all right. Let's quickly have a look at some of these things you guys have got. Uh, DJ Z says, Tom, do you have any US broker suggestions for trading indices currency and commodities oh i i only like suggesting people i've used um and i don't live in the us and you know what i've soured on the idea of these free brokers i don't like them i think they're just i don't like them i i don't mind paying 10 to 15 dollars brokerage to be honest I, i think that if you've got like a good platform it's worthwhile having it like you're meant to be a trader you don't want to have some stupid like pro level two that you're paying ten dollars a month for i think you should be using a proper broker like that has that kind of stuff uh mm, customer service would be a big thing for me and i've dealt with some of the u.s brokers before i know some people use schwab or schwab or however you say it I know some people use interactive brokers. I've never had like an extremely good experience with their platform. Uh, there are, I have to I have to get a US approved one, but I haven't used them. So I will not state. I have got money in the US on, on some Australia plans that work with Australia. Yeah. So I've been using the options one. What is it? Tradey. Oh, I always forget its name. 
tasty tasty works is it tasty works i've been using that a little bit that's been okay wait it's not tasty works tasty trades i think it's tasty works i think it's tasty works <clears throat> yeah there's been okay um that's actually had a pretty good options platform but i can't speak for the rest of it Maybe some people here have some good suggestions for you. We'll see what they say. All right. I'll go over some of these suggestions here. So Microsoft doing people dirty, AMD and AI ETFs. I do not have an AI ETF that I personally have um, selected. I've just been basically owning the FANG. I kind of feel like they're the best AI companies. I'm sure there's others, but I don't really know <laughs> what they are and I don't have time to research them all. AMD here uh, still looking okay as long as it holds above this 102 zone. You can really see how that would be a collapse if it got underneath there. It's bought off this 102. It's the 50 exponential and the daily. If it gets underneath, I feel like it could go significantly down. Next buy zone would be around 95, actually 95, 96. I would draw a box across that level. I think that's a solid uh, zone. Let's take a look at the weekly 20. Yeah, somewhere around here is good. So what I would do is I would draw my little box if I liked AMD. And I would put it like that. Maybe up to that week. And then I'd set an alert for the top. And if it came down, then I'd, I'd be looking at that. But right now it's sitting around support. So that's fine. TMO. Thermo Fisher, great trade. Well done, Clem. This is a good one. So it's it's uh, double bottom there. Oh, I love the double bottom into the break. When you see this strategy, guys, the double bottom, the breakout here, and there's two peaks, do you know that your percentage chance of smashing that peak is incredibly high because it's done the right basing? Remember, this is a beautiful double bottom. It's got incredible chances of doing that. Let's have a look if it's completed the full channel here take that distance oh damn it's done 80 percent oh man what are you doing with it kim what are you doing with it <laughs> i i mean for me i'd be like hell yeah <laughs> but, uh, i'd scale that one off yeah can we do silver let's do silver 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 looks a bit sick at this stage it's on the level of heavy support. We've done that kind of December. I mean, Tyrone came up with that December play, which is uh, not bad for a seasonal for gold. It would be similar for silver. All metals are getting smashed in terms of like the big ones, like iron ore is getting just demolished. You look at the stocks here today in Australia, the iron ore stocks, oh, it's brutalization. And um, look, let's check this one out. Look at that. Oh, see? This stock, I tell you, when it goes up, it's great. It's a trading stock. And when it goes down, it gets brutalized. This bottom will be found soon, though. I hope it finds it around this 1230. I'm sure some of you guys, or 1250, sorry. I, I think I think somewhere around there is, is where we're going to base here. And iron ore will become okay again. But this is a very brutal sell-off here across the board there. Silver, you're saying, can it go down to 1650-ish level? Not that low. I feel like 20 ish, 2050, somewhere around here would be the next stop for it. And then after that, you, you're talking about that 18, 19 zone. If it got underneath here, I'd be incredibly worried. This, These levels, this is an incredibly important support. And if it is broken, it could retest back and then sell off considerably. But I'm actually going to stay away from silver for the time being. If you're short, congrats. I think this is a great level to um, scaling, scaling principles of technical analysis. But uh, I'll be coming back into this market somewhere in October like to, to discuss turnarounds. I'll be looking for gold to base off. Um, I'm looking for gold potentially down to this level, and then we'll, we'll see what happens. I think there's better trades than gold and silver right now. you got crypto in certain areas that's been pretty good. I mean, look at this. Even crypto is getting belted a little bit. Even the, big, the Bitcoins is going down. Surprised it's actually down here. That's not good. I'd hope this reverses. That's a pretty brutal sell-off, really, when you think about it. Because this was a great range, and that is a sucky candle. And it's happening because the rest of the market is pushing through. 
So for crypto, that is a bad candle, I got to say. We'll see how it closes. Can you like take a look at the TSX? Curious on your thoughts on the Canadian market? Yeah, I never really look at the TSX. Let's have a look. Why not? Okay. I haven't looked at the the breakdown of the Canadian market, but I assume it's got tons of uh, oil in it, tons of energy, that type of stuff. Got the 50, got the 50. Had a closure below, which kind of makes me less trust the technicals here. 50, 50. What happened over here? Energy. Hmm. Not much to really report other than the 20 has remained probably the better level for the pickups. And it's in line with the US market at the moment. See, I use the US as the, the key. And then what happens is once you decide the US is broken below, you just quickly look at the sectors. And if the sectors are all tech, then of course that's going to less affect these types of markets. But if, the, if it's a sell-off across the board, then you can use the US as the better technical and then pick up the Canadian market or whatever it might be around that point. If I was looking here at the, the weekly, I would basically just draw a straight horizontal across that and just be looking somewhere around this 20,000 level, which is where the 20 is. Yeah, I like the weekly 21, 20 on this. Uh, yes, says, how about gold, which has a head and shoulders on the one day drop from $80 from last few days? Uh, yeah, I think that, that gold, head and shoulders. Let's have a look here at gold. Uh, yeah, up here, you mean? Yeah, I think it's probably more of like an eight-hour, four-hour head and shoulders. I think it's bad. It looks bad. This this new breakout here could really push gold. Uh, we're talking 1720 next support. You can see those bodies. And then after that, you're talking 16, 1680 kind of zone. So yeah, this 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 closure, if it does occur, is is actually quite bearish. Lou said, hit the thumbs up, people help the channel. 14 out of 634 is pathetic. <laughs> no, it's all good, Lou. Remember, we use this for our private hangouts and obviously our webinars and those types of things. So we do appreciate everyone coming out here today. Um, obviously, I think I might have set it up incorrectly, but this is the private hangout, guys. Um, and we do this every Monday or Sunday in America. So this market still falling off here. The US market, that is 0.34% down. If it opens and closes like this in America, you truly will be underneath the 50. And we can talk dirty about next levels. <laughs> we'll be using puts heavily to find the lows if that does happen. FMG is brutal indeed. Yes, unfortunately, that is what happens. Uh, Kim says, I think FMG, BHP, Rio will find a base soon. I agree. Super funds need to put their money somewhere, even if the ASX 200. Yes, and they also know the PE ratios on all those stocks. So it's all going to be about iron ore. So if you actually have a look at iron ore, I think we can get rebar futures or something like that in here. So let's have a look at iron ore rebar futures. Bring your questions. Keep going, guys. I'll, I'll answer as many as I can. So if we look here and, and we bring it across. Oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, this... This is getting close to, I mean, you can tell that's that's crap. This is exactly what always happens, guys. You can't see the previous history, but I can tell you that this is quite common uh, in in metals and, and this is what happens. You get that huge boom and then you get a mega bust. I'm actually excited about this zone. I'm excited. The base is coming, guys. It's got to be because look, look at this. It's highly likely based on the fact that we've hit that before in 19, and I will still say this, demand should be increased since that point because we need to rebuild economies. Governments have, they don't just drip feed the money in. They go like this. The money goes like this for a long time and it always has like that bigger payoff than people expect and then drops off. Construction will still be high and unless the entire economy fails, you'd have to think that, that iron ore is getting close to lows. I think it could also be in a seasonally low point at this point. Go check out Iron Ore Seasonals, uh, equityclock.com, I believe it has. Truly Messiah says, bye-bye, BTC. 
I'm not, well, you know, I'm invested in BTC, so <laughs> no, you don't, you don't go back down. And if you do, I'll have to buy more of you. Nah, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. But at this stage, I don't like that closure. <clears throat> oh, my God. Uh, market futures look rough along with crypto. I must say I am surprised that Bitcoin is underneath this zone. But it hasn't closed yet. Let's see what the what happens there. Check out BTC shorts as well. Mm, negligible. Don't wake me up Monday. Yes. The dollar's strong, so metals are weak. Let's have a look, quick look at DXY. <clears throat> mm, quite strong. Once it closed above this zone, there was a marginal position there and then a few others. This is strong. Um, I would maintain that the dollar should continue to strengthen as well. Uh, Ryan W says, tasty is good, charts suck. Oh, come on, man. You think I load the charts up on that one, Ryan? Absolutely not. I agree with you. It's all about the fact that we've got like, we use the trading view or another good charting software. I don't even like to mix my charts with the real the real trading platforms. It makes me think about the position. Having that little bit of kind of level of designation. I do my charts here. I write down what I want and I put them over there. You mentally conceptualize the idea and what you're trying to do. And when you do that, then you usually make better decisions. You met, usually do better decisions. I've got a question here about US dollar Swiss. I'm one of my most hated pairs, this one. US dollar Swiss. Oh, yep. Another one that's broken out very heavily to the long side, similar to a lot of others. It's had a nice trend line on it. So currencies, you can see here, guys, have have pretty good trend lines and pretty good, you know, buy, buy pressures that happen. Nice. Let's go to the daily. Great breakup. This is a solid, this is a solid scale in, another solid. And you would think that it's going towards that 95 area. Not a fan of the currency, but yes, this is a uh, solid breakout. Nice higher lows, etc. Thoughts on odd US dollar? I'll do one more currency while we're here. Pretty, pretty bearish. That's the first little level. And then underneath that, participation down to 71 again. How do you feel about banks such as BMO? know nothing about this bank i don't feel very strong on banks but i'm completely negative on banks for the next five years i rallied them and i'm actually done with them and i mean i'm done with them from an investment standpoint i'm finished on banks i like new style fintech from what i understand and from what i see and from what i understand about millennials and I'm going to get one myself. I'm going to get that new PayPal card. I, I think it's out in Australia. Kim, tell me if it's out in Australia. I'm going to use those cards, guys. I really am. Because these banks, they make great money. They get paid off by whatever you know central bank they're part of. But look at the rallies. We can quantify very easily what a good PE ratio is for these. We understand their businesses. Everyone in the market understands their businesses. So when you try to trade a bank, all you're doing is this. You look at the five-year average of the PE. And you'll notice it rotates kind of like this. And sometimes it does that. And when the PE ratio becomes ridiculous for a bank, I know everyone says, oh, it doesn't matter. PE ratios don't matter. They matter for businesses that you can quantify how much money they make. And unless they're doing acquisitions or something like that, if I saw a PE that was way higher than the median or the mean, no way I would touch that. No, 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 no. But if you want to trade it, absolutely. Uh, at this stage, it looks like it's kind of weakening. You've got peak, you've got trough, you've got the potential of a lower peak here. And if you get a closure underneath this zone in the 20 on the weekly, then you'd be looking at sell-off. But I am i can't say I'm a fan of them. Like if you've got them there for income, do I think they'll hover? Yeah, I think they'll kind of do this. But I don't think there's huge gains in these types of things. That's just my opinion. They're more of a income, stabilization, that kind of stuff. Fake market futures? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the real market will sort this one out. 
take a look at Zoom. Sure. Zoom, we talked about last week, we were looking for a closure up above. It actually rejected the base here on Friday. Uh, I'm not against this, this stock where it is. Um, obviously, the market will dictate what's going on. But this is a relatively decent turnaround here on the daily. I'm looking for it to get above 301. So my ideal is here. If I saw that, mwah, we go to look to Zoom. If you're buying here, have your tight stop losses in place or have your option strategy in place just in case it spikes you out. But Zoom is not necessarily terrible right now. And you can see the volume is still peaked on where it's been for a very long time. I don't hate it. I, I know I should hate it, but I don't hate it. <clears throat> VIX over 22, yes. The VIX will spike heavily if, it, if the market opens here and it, it keeps like floating down. And the futures are certainly going red here. What if we were, imagine if we were here by market open, 15.2 on the NASDAQ. You'd have to think there's buyers there. Let's have a look at the FANG. We'll look at the FAANG. Another signal that things are weakening in the market here when you when you think about it. Let's go to the uh, four hour on the FANG. You see that closure below. Apple kind of shows the way here. Google shows the way. Again, if anyone missed it, take a look at this Apple. Nasty. Could go down to 142, 141. Go to Google. Nasty. Uh, what else have we got here? Microsoft. Well, it's doing its own thing. What about Facebook? <clears throat> Facebook right on our incredibly good trend line. You know, you can see these serious breaks occurring here. This is no joke. The whole other time while we were pulling back previously, a lot of these stocks weren't showing weakness. Remember, this is the first time we've started to see weakness through all of the FANG stocks. And we know these things, if they go down, the rest of the market tanks with them. So Facebook, an important point. Amazon, I think still cheap in comparison to the others. Apple, bad looking. And then we've got Google here. It looks bad. Did it look bad during the pullback that we saw previously? No, the FANG did not lead the other pullback. This time around though, the fangs starting to look shaky. Lunch Money says lots of banks buying back their stock after Fed approved their stock buybacks plan in the US. I totally agree with you, Lunch, but again, it is short-sighted. If Kathy Wood is right on one thing, and I personally 100% agree with her on this, I will be, I, I if I'm wrong on this, I'll own it. I'll own that I'm wrong. I don't believe that banks are investing in their futures. Guys, what do you think? Now, you can totally disagree with me. I don't believe they're investing in their futures. Now, they could acquire, but doing buybacks is short-sighted policy, which they've done before, to reward themselves and other shareholders. If you want to win the next decade to two decades worth of banking, financial institutions, and millennial money, you have to invest back in the business right now. And if you don't, it will be very, very bad. Do you think this might be related to the Evergrande? I don't really. They might use it as an excuse. Again, the, the Chinese government can bail that situation if they choose to. It's a lot of money, I understand, but they've got a great balance sheet, that government. They can get it done if they want to. DXY seems like it's uh, like it gets strong right before FOMC. Then <clears throat> when they keep pumping stim packs, dollar will go down to 91 that's a fair point, Blue Maserati, absolutely. Wintermute says you should allow Super Chats here. Oh, well, this is only for private community members, but I think I accidentally stuffed it today. So if you want to get it, <laughs> it's the private community. <laughs> Bitcoin at 46, that's right, yeah. I don't like it, but I'm actually surprised. I, I Look, I'll say I'm surprised. I thought this would hold this zone. I liked that so much. I liked it into the resistance. It looked like it was flagging as well, but at the same time, we're consolidating above the peak. I'll watch the day. We'll find out what happens. I'm not concerned, but uh, yeah, that will take out trades right now. Trades will be out. Kunal says, I actually wrote an article about how the Combank, uh, Combank's uh, buyback was a dumb idea. Yeah, I mean, Combank's in a good situation, but we've got to think, in Australia, I understand the banks pretty well. A lot of them have sold their businesses over the years, like sold big portions. I think that's going to hurt them a little bit. 
All right. So markets are down. Should we be concerned? Not really. I think we've been prepping for this type of thing. Now we look for the big put walls for this week. So on the SPY, just again to reiterate, where we know there are calls and puts, we know there are a relatively high amount of puts sitting around 430. To check this, you can either use our room, which obviously I would suggest, or you can go September 24th here, refresh it. <clears throat> and what you're wanting to see this week is just them to load that 430 strike up on the puts. So let's take a look at, is it September 24th? Yeah, Friday. So we'll scroll through here. Uh, yeah, okay, so some calls, some decent calls here, 450 strike. <laughs> Poor retail traders getting absolutely demolished there. Oh, I feel almost bad for them, almost bad for them. Hopefully you guys aren't those people. Then we scroll down here and we've got the puts expiring and we see here 368. Okay, we keep going down. Keep going down, 440. Where are we? 440. Can't be right. Is it that low? I thought that was different. Might need to check that on tomorrow's data. Anyway, the point is, look how little puts there are in comparison to the calls. See the calls here? Where are they? 450s. There we go. So the calls have huge amounts of open interest on them in comparison to the puts. And that's important. And that's why the market is allowed to potentially go down. Now, I'm pretty sure 430 has some big strikes on it, whether it's at the end of the month this week or next month. Well, we can look at next month's right here. Uh, here we go. Next month's. <clears throat> There's got some big strikes around here. So there will be some, some buying off some of these zones. 430 is my next strike though for the spy i'm looking for it to go down to that zone full pullback uh, best i think we could hope for is around 400 if it does occur and if the market ends uh, starts off red here i would consider today probably going to be a bullish bounce what do you guys reckon what do you think bullish bounce today or not if it keeps going red let's give it a scenario here us 100 Currently 15,239. We've gotten underneath that little weird marginal support. We're going towards 15,2-ish zone and the 50 exponential on the daily. What do you guys think happens if we open here? Thoughts? Let us know right now. <clears throat> uh, healthcare. Well, you know I love healthcare for the, for the medium long term. Uh, healthcare is a partial, a partial kind of hedge. And it's been getting a little bit beaten. Do you, you do any crypto staking? Not really. <clears throat> I've considered it. I know it's good. Crypto staking is good. But I, I've got to say, it makes no sense to me. I've, I've tried to understand it. And I understand the story behind it. But sometimes, like, I understand the story behind it. But realistically... I wouldn't put all my money in the stake. Let's just say that. It, it's cool in principle and Ponzi-like in other ways, <laughs> if you get what I'm saying. It's kind of scary both ways there. If it opens red, it's going to accelerate. I feel like it'll hit basis here. Evergrande, here comes the domino effect. Be careful there, Lee. I, I don't know if that's as bad as people like it's bad but again if they choose to they will protect it it is not in china's best interest to let their economy partially collapse right now it's a bad idea for them what would you do if you had let's say you had a bank vault you're the leader <clears throat> you don't want to go into hardship you don't want people protesting in the streets you're not going to you're already really rich and incredibly powerful and you have the ability to fix the situation what would you do? Would you fix it and just go, oh, cool, and then obviously punish on the back end in terms of not allowing change regulation, et cetera, to fix that problem in the future? Would you fix it, number one, or would you let it play out? <clears throat> Surely JP is the catalyst slash confirmation for either upward or down longer term direction until they just seasonality bull bounce. My VIX call will be printing if we open there. Uh, yeah, your VIX call will probably be quite a lot higher. Uh, Lieutenant Dan says, I would think at least a little bounce, even if it heads lower eventually. Uh, I would agree with you there, Lieutenant Dan. 
bounce and then it comes down again. Then it breaks the, I assume you're saying, support there, Kuno. Bounce then down to test the break lower since Monday as a trading day. Trades are weird. Yes. <laughs> 15 2, then bounce to 15 three five eight then bearish to fourteen seven fifty ooh nice Ray Lim says fix it Jassa says bail out yes and then Kunal says give crumbs to peasants <laughs> I'm not sure Kunal are we are we allowed to I don't know if we're allowed to let you be the, the number one you call them peasants that's not very cool no, I get what you say, though. It's all good. Chronically, Sam says, fix, no questions asked. Yeah, well, yeah, I think they have to ask quick. They need to fix it with regulation. And you can't bail every sector. It's it's too much. It is a lot of money. You've got to let some things fall. Lunch money, spy, lots of open interest for options expiring. Tomorrow is 445. I think it closes green tomorrow. Look, these are all valid uh, valid concerns. We've got to be nimble and fast. We've got key levels. We've got 15.2 on the, on the NASDAQ. The US 500 is pretty easy to see that somewhere around this zone is going to be key. And why? Because if we go back over, around this zone is going to be our 20 moving average weekly. So should we come down this week, around that 430 is where I expect puts to be absolutely stacked on the SPY. I would like to go through specific stocks, but you guys can see what's happening. It's, uh, you know, what stock can we really look at that we're like, oh, yeah, that's that's glorious or anything like that. Every one of these stocks can get belted around during a bit of a sell-off. If you want to buy specific stocks, just pick your favorite ones, find the key supports, and then you're basically looking at picking up those levels. I generally prefer, for investment, you obviously can buy just, you know, dip zones that you like technically. But um, I do prefer usually waiting for the lightning bolt, waiting for the smaller time frame, turn around, those types of things. When's the options class? Oh, the options class is actually out <clears throat> right now. So you can uh, basically do the pre-order for it. We're limiting it to 100 spots. I can tell a lot of people have already signed up. And I will quickly just remind everyone, if you go to fxevolution.com at the moment uh, there's only a few spots left in the mentoring for october so if you're interested in it i would suggest you pick it up today um, and if you don't uh, it will be taken up i'd say so if you're interested i think it's a it's a great program i designed it with tyrone uh, i believe it is the icing on the cake if you want to say it that way it's a lot of what we talk about here but it's that little bit of extra uh, actionable data that we talk about obviously some of the great strategies that we like to use so if you're interested, you can check it out. It's all the structured information is there. Feel free to message me if you have any other questions. But right now, look, it's an exciting time in the market. Some people, I'm sure someone's hurting out there. I, I, I'm I, sad if that's you, um, but I think it's an exciting time. And in some ways, it's needed for a healthy market. Remember, I've always talked about we want two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back market. We don't want a vertical because then we get into a Shanghai composite style situation and we really, really don't want to be in this situation. I mean, you might think you do, but it's kind of like that that famous blizzard thing. You think you do, but you don't. And in some ways it came true <laughs> because they released what that WoW Classic game. People played it for about four weeks and they gave up on it. So yes, this is not an ideal style market. Parabolicness always leads to serious pain. And I can tell you, while most people here probably aren't aware of what happened in China over this time, very sad things happened during this pullback because of leverage. <clears throat> uh, Kunal, yeah, it'd probably be tasty at the moment. Tasty works. So people who bought the spy at 50 EMA about to get crushed, that would be me. <clears throat> um, I'm surprised you bought, like, did you buy, did you scale in? It probably would be a classic case of scaling, um, which you should do at those points, Lou. But it doesn't, look, I don't think you're going to get long-term crushed. It just depends what your plan is. If you've leveraged that area, then yeah. I, You know how like everyone knew something? When everyone knows something, it often stuffs you up. So like over here, let's say here we we knew 50 was was interesting based on previous. 
Here we knew it was even better. Here we really knew it was good. Here we knew it was even better, better. And then every single person knew it. Every single person knew it. And they also knew the, all the date systems. So we mentioned the date systems and we mentioned it back here. But you've got that that one thing that I've always stood with and I've been pretty consistent on this, hence why I'm going neutral to neutralizing in the market, is that I'd never discount September and yet everyone was harassing me on YouTube saying you are wrong. I didn't say it's going to die. <laughs> I just said it's going to be neutral to slow, fast, nimble trading. And when you think about it, if we go back to this date over here and we think about July, look at the US 500. Has it really been that amazing since July? Well, the price is basically the same. So we can go through all of August, all of September. The only problem is that a lot of people have always been trading the NASDAQ because you should. I mean, the NASDAQ got better companies in it. And, and when you think about it, the July position has just come back in. So really nothing has happened on this market since July. All the big bullish movements have been all the way over here. And I, I feel like we got these incredibly with the community. We talked about this. We talked about the huge buy-up of bio, of healthcare. And I think we've done well, but we've got to move partially neutral to optimistic over long term. Lou said, because of you, I scaled in. You're a champ. Good work. Nice. You've got big brain, man. And you know what the worst thing that would have happened is it would have bounced up, gapped open high, still pulled back a bit, moved above that, and then you could continue to scale. And guess what? You can sleep easy because if the market comes down more, okay, you're losing on one side. But think about it. You've got the opportunity to put some of your other powder, some of your other ability to put in the market at a cheaper price. No one likes losing, I understand. But when the market comes down, and you're only scaled in a portion, and then you wait for that big turnaround effect, then you'll do a lot better. And I'll admit one thing here as well. <clears throat> While I was bullish on this turnaround here, because it is a lightning bolt, you're not getting the low, no doubt. <laughs> uh, that was that was something else. That was uh, a drop, drop the mic moment last year. But it's difficult to rescale back in here. So that's why you've got to follow the technicals and you could have easily thought it was a dead cat bounce. And you have to go and really study the GFC to, to understand whether you would have got stuffed over during that time following similar strategies. So you, you need to learn from past, past kind of crashes um, how you're going to trade the future. But in this case, we usually look for the turnarounds. Uh, Ted Blair, Tad, sorry, Tad. Blair said, Zed closed above 95, looking for the 100 level. Might have to watch it close next week if volume will be in town. I totally agree. Zed is a sleeper. It is a sleeper. And, and it came through strong. This is a great chart. I'm going to imprint that one into my mind. Look at this, guys. Oh, oh, yeah. Look at all those lower peaks. Look at the double bottom. And it ain't Barber. Stupid Barber. It's not Barber, so therefore it doesn't have the same risks that we got after. <laughs> I, I really, really, really am dirty on that Barber. Not because I'm dirty, because I'm dirty for you guys in losing potential faith on the fact that double bottoms into beautiful repair trend lines. So, of course, we close above here and we're looking great. And then we, we look to scale in over time. But I'm dirty for you guys because this is... This is a solid setup. You know, you've got double bottom. You've got a great resistance. If it closes above the resistance, you're breaking through the downward trend line. It looks just like Barber. But in Barber's case, you got smashed by the government. In this case, it's more unlikely you get smashed by the government. So, yes, it's a sleeper. No one talks about it anymore. When someone doesn't talk about something, I get a little bit, I, I start looking for recovery plays. Here's the Barber scenario. I've left it there. It's the exact same thing. Look. Double bottom, breakout, blah, government. <laughs> uh, that's why you got to play practice stop losses on your trades. Remember, investing and trading, slightly different. Investing, you usually don't have a stop loss. Trade, you're looking for that big movement. So you shouldn't really lose more than your risk amount on these types of trades. But you can see it's the exact same thing. It's just so nasty. <clears throat> 
To, uh, Tom, what is the low on the NASDAQ? Uh, at the moment, the NASDAQ is down at 15,236. Uh, I expect it to hit the 50. So around this level here, go into the four hour maybe to confirm it a little bit better. I, I would find it hard to believe the market would crash underneath this into, into at least the open. Anything's possible, as you know, but... That's that's a pretty solid like previous resistance. You've got to think there's some some potential for little buyers to come through here. All right, we'll take a couple of other questions and then we'll do it. Barber is a tease. It certainly is. That's why we wait for recovery now, Lieutenant Dan. And even then, <laughs> totally if you want to do recovery. Uh, stupid thing. Let's have a look at BNTX, Biontech SE. Mm, very nice. So you went long on this. Love the support, 322. I can understand why you picked that up. Let's have a look at the daily. Okay, so it's rejected off the little 20. It'll probably be down today because the rest of the market is, but it doesn't mean you've done bad. Uh, I think it's good for a scale. You've got kind of your lows, your, your wicking lows. You've got your bullish hammer. You've got your long leg doji. You've closed above at least just on the bullish hammer. So it's what we call like a marginal style position here. So you're looking for it to get above there. And then uh, then the really big test for this one, because you're looking at it, I assume, from a double bottom standpoint here, is to get past this great resistance here. I love this resistance. And you get past there and then, yes, absolutely. This is a scaling opportunity more than anything else. But there are great levels coming up. And I can see why you might have, might have had a little bit of a taste there. Support very clear as well around that 320. Uh, if they keep the NASDAQ there, then will they have to pay out the puts? Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't really know who owns the puts. It could be them. It could be anyone. Generally on the bear side, this is just an indication. So he's talking about here, guys, which is the October puts. And they're all over the place on the NASDAQ. You can see there's calls, there's puts, they're equal. So they're equal all around this, what is this, 370 kind of area. And then there's just a put put fest all the way down on October for the NASDAQ. Remember, it's only on expiration. So markets can dump underneath a put zone and then buy back up. You're using options just to augment or help your technical analysis. Don't use this as number one, Jasser. It is only to help you understand key support levels and how the interaction in those zones may occur. You still follow the TA principles that we always use. All right. We will uh, do one more and then we will probably finish up here. Remember to subscribe, guys, if you haven't already subscribed to this channel. Uh, it is our second channel, obviously. If you want, if I've accidentally made this public today, welcome to the 83 people. This is the private community chat that we do every Monday. You can subscribe, free seven day trial over at fxevolution.com if you're interested. We do have the mentoring spots closing. Uh, over the next 24 hours or 48 hours or whatever. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to us, check us out. And the options course has been released in pre-order phase. So uh, some of it's already active and you can see the dates over on our website. LSPD at the peak, uh, long leg doji, four hour, go the daily. Yeah, a bit of indecision at the peak here for this. This is a package software, which I never know what that means whatever the hell package software means. Uh, yeah, I mean, it It kind of looks like it. people took profit here a little bit. You close above this zone, then we can keep rallying. Next stop would maybe be like a 140. And from a weakness side, pull back back to the 20 moving average on the daily would make sense. Uh, it It's pretty marginal. It's not one I would trade. But if you're in it, I mean, you don't really, you can't really be crying about the current price action. Didn't realize we've been in a bear market since March. Saw on Twitter, but most things been getting wrecked besides the spy where 10 companies make up 25%. It depend, you, you mean like if you look at like the Nikkei or something like that and, and you check out some of these markets, this one's recovered because of Abenomics style policies. You can see here the recovery and, and the rally. So if you look at like the DAX, the DAX has been neutralized for quite some time you look at the asx 200 
the ASX 200 has been actually okay, I'd say, but still fairly neutralized. I don't think we're in a bear market since that point. I just think that we've seen uh, some weakness in companies that deserve to be weak and tech deserves to be less weak. So therefore, if you've got the best country in the world's tech, which is America, believe me, you guys have better tech than we do here in Australia. We have payment systems that you bought us, <laughs> that you bought from us um, and an accounting software company. Uh, basically, yeah. I mean, why wouldn't tech do well when still a lot of people are locked in? It's all the tech. Winter Mute says, bought the options class. Welcome, Winter. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. And then Philip uh, Lengen says, thanks, Tom. I think I was one of your free attendees, but definitely make me want to join. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a little bit sneaky of you guys, a little sneaky. <laughs> but that was my bad, and uh, I do appreciate you guys coming over here as well. Breakdown, uh, FX Russ says breakdown down on BTC and ETH the last 45 minutes. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty lame. Um, I didn't expect us to get underneath this rally. This looked pretty damn good. It really did. Everything was looking fantastical. And then this market dropping off is hurting. Remember, Bitcoin does go down with the market. So once the market starts tanking past a certain percentage, Bitcoin comes with it. This is unfortunate. It is unfortunate sell-off here occurring on the BTCs. It should have held here. This is a good trade that I would always take uh, to the long side. It hit the first resistance and he could have scaled it off and then gotten back in. But yeah, particularly these buys over here, fantastic buying. Um, up until that point, I, that candle, meh. I mean, next, next uh, kind of level is around here. I'm not concerned about Bitcoin. All right, we'll finish this one off. Uh, Lim Jun Hun. Hey, Tom, why is the SPX and SPY tickers show different charts? That is true, it does. SPX shows a bounce on the EMA 50, but SPY shows a slight, well, it is a slight break below the 50. I wondered that myself. The SPY is an ETF trust, so it should be slightly wrong. Because it gets wrote, I think it get. I haven't really looked at the breakdown of the SPY. I don't use this chart generally. I just use it because I know everyone in America buys this one. I use the SPX. I use the real market. That There must be some rotational thing that happens here or the price is slightly different due to a roll. Because remember, this is a true ETF. So it should be slightly under tracking the market. It shouldn't be perfect. Whereas this should be theoretically perfect to tr proper market conditions. I could be wrong, but I would say that's it. QQQ, if you're wondering the level as well, you're just looking at this uh, strange, what is this, 369.50 zone. I want to wish everyone the best here. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got 88 people joining right now. That means good luck in China, I believe, or very, very lucky. I'm feeling lucky this week. I hope you guys are too. And I appreciate, um, yeah, if you subscribe, give us a like on this video and uh, we will see you in the private community, the public community, the live streams, wherever you might be. It's getting exciting, guys, but uh, never fear. The optimism should remain throughout the markets. You've just got to find your key zones that you like and always watch your FANG stocks, your Apple, your Googles, your Facebooks. When they start breaking key supports, you've got to pay some attention. And uh, yeah, it looks like it's going to be one of those days, guys. Thanks so much. Bye for now.